All right, my name is Chris Knowlton, and this is the panel on streaming deployments in higher education. Thank you for coming today, uh, right after lunch for many of you, so try not to sleep too hard or anything. We'll try and make it interesting <laughs> enough that that is not something that you want to do anyway. Um, the, the idea here is that video is so ubiquitous today that it is trickling into enterprises and education around the world, and we want to find out a little bit more about how people in education who are in charge of video deployments are doing it, what methods they're using, what's being successful, uh, and give us a little bit of insight into how that works and what we can learn from it, and, and from perhaps from some of the, the hard-fought lessons or hard-learned lessons that they've learned. And so uh, I have a number of questions that I plan to ask our fine panel here, and I'll let them introduce themselves in just a moment. And then what we'd really like to do is encourage audience participation. And so the way we'll try and do it, at least with the first question, is I'll ask a question and ask each of these gentlemen to, to take a minute or two to briefly respond to the question and then open up the floor so that if you have questions, just let us know and we'll try and engage that way. Uh, but if you have something that's urgent, you've got to ask it right now, then just raise your hand and we'll try and get to it right away. So let's give it a go. Uh, panelists, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves. I'll start uh, with you, Gary, and, and we'll just go down the line. Well, he kind of did it already. But I, good, good afternoon. I'm Gary Powell from the University of Toledo, out of Toledo, Ohio. I am a technology analyst for the College of Education. So I'm not in the traditional line of IT, but sort of a subset deal specifically for the College of Education. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Andy Page from Cornell University, uh, where I manage the audio video engineering team including video streaming and hosting, video conferencing, digital signage, and classroom design and consulting. Hi, uh, I'm Christopher Miano. I'm from Temple University's Fox School of Business, uh, senior technology support specialist. I help support all of the online digital learning at the Fox School of Business, and I mostly focus on the graduate programs. And uh, I'm Ernest Fernandez. I'm the director of video technology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Day-to-day, uh, -day I manage and supervise the video production group. Uh, we produce commercials, promos, informational segments, traditional video production material, but we also produce a number of webcasts, um, athletic events, uh, commencement ceremonies, and of late, we've had a big push to get uh, what we call, or to engage our faculty in more streaming and uh, on-demand video for use as a dynamic element in their classes. Great. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, let's let's kick it off then. I, I guess what would be interesting for me to understand, and probably for the rest of our audience, is uh, in your universities, can you tell us about the streaming media scenarios that you've worked on deploying, and and what those deployments look like? Well, uh, this time, uh, we'll, we'll make it fair. We'll start at the other end. Ernest, can okay. you can you kick us off? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so. Different types of streaming media deployment, uh, athletic events, we do a three camera, more broadcast webcast, three cameras, continuity package, use a TriCaster, um, HD available. Uh, commencement ceremonies and the state of the university addresses, we produce it the same way, three cameras, HD TriCaster or the TriCaster 860, continuity package. More and more, we're involved in special events around the university. And what's interesting about this is you have guest lecturers or researchers or poets, authors that um, are in small spaces. So we've developed a different type of streaming package for that. Still HD available, but using a smaller appliance, a live stream broadcaster. And we've had a lot of success with that particular deployment. And probably I would like to talk about that a little later. Um, and then we pre-produce the video for our online hybrid and even traditional courses. So we have a studio space, but we can also do location stuff. Um, and we are also we are promoting in that scenario a lot of do-it-yourself video with our faculty. I, I brought this as it's a functional prop, but it is a prop to show kind of what we're presenting to our faculty as a alternative to a traditional video camera to use in their classrooms or with their students for student projects. And of course, uh, UTSA has a large amount of lecture capture. Uh, one of my associates uh, who's out in the audience, Robert Granado, takes care of that for us. Um, basically, when I was asking him how much we do in lecture capture, the number that stuck out to me was uh, 2,500 hours of lecture capture a year. So that's pretty good. And that's on the Helix Media Library that, that supports that. And that, uh, in a nutshell, is our scenarios, de deployment, streaming. 
Great, thanks, Ernest. Christopher, how about you? So, uh, for our online programs, we have uh, pre recorded videos that we do, and we have a, a film studio there. And we have the professors come in ahead of time and record them, and then we post that up on, online. It's hosted by Vimeo, and then with that, we can embed them like either in the Blackboard courses or anywhere we want, really, for the university. Then we do, we also have live synchronous sessions that we have with the students. And for that, we use uh, web conferencing. We use uh, WebEx. And so with that, we can have two-way communication between the professor and all the students. We can put them in groups using that and have them work together. And the, teach, the teacher or professor can walk through the different groups and be able to communicate. And then they can all bring that back to the main session. And then also, we do um, sort of like a larger production web conference. We do uh, like international workshops a lot for the MBAs. And this is a, so we have partner schools in like Cali, Colombia, Paris, and Japan, and stuff like that. And so what we do for that is uh, we, they have the professors come into the studio, and we have production, a whole production set up, and then we use that, um, all that studio quality footage that we can get, we put that into the web conferencing software, and then we have the students be able to interact with the professor in that way. All right, thank you. Andy? Yep. Uh, so at Cornell, uh, we have a, a variety of use cases we're using both Kaltura and uh, media site for video streaming and, and playback both live and, and on demand. Um, the academic use cases consist of things like video playback in the classroom or lesson preparation uh, or classroom capture. Um, our media site deployment, we're currently averaging about 6,500 hours of content viewed per quarter. Uh, so that's um, in support of 30 recorders that are that are uh, embedded in, class, in classrooms across the campus. Uh, we do a lot of live events uh, as well. So we do um, State of the University, Commencement, Convocation, um, Trustee Weekend, Alumni Reunions, uh, those types of events. So those are special events. We might do a multi-camera, might be a single camera shoot um, with, with venues that may be outfitted with that equipment or, or maybe not. We might have to bring in you know, a, a truck or, or some sort of production package. Um, the, the libraries are using uh, our Kaltura uh, SAS deployment for video streaming, uh, all their collections, so that's a, uh, a new, use new, new use case for them. They've built integrations into the institutional repository uh, with, with that, uh, that deployment. Uh, we're also using uh, uh, video streaming and inward and outward facing communications. We have a product called Cornell Cast which is, uh, you know, if you go to cornell.edu forward slash video, that's where all the showcased videos are about the university. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's, uh, that's used by our marketing team. We're doing webcasts of, of concerts, uh, special events. There's a venue called Bailey Hall, which is set up with a, a five camera HD production package with um, switching and, and the whole the whole nine yards uh, for doing live HD webcasts and and really nice sound as well so we can push out these webcasts to alumni and and uh, parents of students so that they can see their their, their son or daughter perform uh, from from anywhere around the globe um, and then and then we're repurposing trainings and seminars colloquiums and other events so content that's being recorded is then being uh, prepared and, and processed and put online so that people can, can consume that content after the fact. That's a lot of stuff. Great. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. How, Gary, how about you? Well, listen to the previous panelists. Uh, the university as a whole are doing a, a, a variety of those. But my area specifically is in the College of Education. And we have a sort of a unique twist on it that most of the community that we're dealing with is outside of the university and the network. So we deploy uh, Polycom video codecs uh, to on-site locations to schools. And we actually use those cameras via the internet to actually record on-site. So in the College of Education, we're capturing uh, uh, classroom uh, observations, say, in the, in the K-12 schools and specifically in science education because we're evaluating uh, project-based science uh, teaching methods, inquiry methods. And also we do uh, capturing of uh, uh, teacher uh, professional development days, uh, focusing in on uh, renewable energy. But we may send out an HD camera with a small crew and actually shoot that, trim it down so we do have some production value. Then we run it through uh, the, uh, our Polycom encoder. So we sort of have uh, 
you know, a studio in a bag, we go out and do it that way, or some things that we may actually use if we have a polycom on a location, and we record using the, poly, uh, the polycom or the video bridge. If we have multiple sites, we want to do that. So, in fact, yesterday we had a site where uh, uh, high school, no, junior high in southeast Michigan was doing presentations on uh, reducing uh, plastic use in restaurants for the, t uh, for the little city that they're in. So they actually, the students were presenting to uh, the business owners. So it's from mom and pop restaurants to actual chain restaurants, your McDonald's, your Burger King. And basically, they're about 75 miles away from the campus, and we just plugged in through the Polycom and used their encoder to record it. And we have the ability, so you could actually have an audience that's connected via video conference, so you have hotspots. But then you can have a second audience that would actually come in and watch it live via stream or on demand. So that's sort of a unique twist on using the, the polycoms as uh, basically as your basic camera. But, but we may get into the history of why that happened, which you can say that's in a very expensive cam webcam. But, <laughs> but it, there's a logic to why that happened. So I've, and if we go further, we can get into that. OK. Uh, before I go on and ask more questions, do any of you have questions just based on the scenarios they've described so far? No. Go ahead, sir. Several of you mentioned you do multi-camera shoots on site. How do you crew them? So the question is, many of, so just for, for the recorded version, many of you mentioned that you do multi-camera shoots on site, and how do you crew them? So anybody want to grab that? <coughs> go ahead, Andy. Uh, we, uh, at the venue that we have, uh, that we have the multi-camera um, installation installed. Um, we have just one pan tilt zoom controller and so depending on the uh, profile of the event it could just be a single person that's operating that whole entire system or you might have two people someone framing shots and shading cameras and then someone else who's more directing the overall production um, and then we would have an audio engineer there anyways and so they're they're basically doing um, two mixes one for the house and then a broadcast mix. The robotic cameras, yeah. Um, and then for other events that require multi-camera, we might bring in Time Warner Cable or the local um, uh, production company to actually staff those events. For the events that, uh, well, we, we have a couple of different ways that we crew depending on what the event is. For athletic, for the home games, athletic home games we do, we, um, we employ part-time student help. For UTSA, that's a bit of a challenge because we do not have a journalism or a RTF program at the university. Um, we usually find students that are involved in some sort of digital communications type of courses or students that are just doing video on their own already, as you probably have discovered at universities, there are a lot of videos being produced and streamed by students that has nothing to do with any of us in this room or at, on this panel. So there, there is the experience out there. For larger events, say um, commencement ceremonies, we'll employ the same part-timers and camera positions, but uh, the rest of my staff who are not students, who are professional professionals in video production, will crew different positions, much like uh, Andy had laid out. We have a set producer, a set director. Uh, we have an audio director, because for larger events, there typically is some sort of interfacing with some front of house sound of some instance. So depending on the event, we, there are six people in my department. We have three to four part-timers at any particular time. Uh, for a three-camera shoot, we usually run about a five to six-man crew. So that's how we do it. For, for the smaller events, we can send one person out and take care of it pretty much. Yes? Yeah, so it sounds like you've got a lot, obviously a lot of campus networking, which is sort of within the local area in your domain. But what about um, wide area? So, like pushing the stuff out to, you know, making great guest lecturers available around the world or whatever it is. Do you have relationships with CDNs or service providers that can make it a wide area experience? Okay, so let me repeat the question. Uh, how do you, you've talked a lot about how you're distributing internally on campus and things like that. How do you push out to more of a global audience with, uh, you know, do you have relations with service providers, CDNs, and the like? Anyone want to take that? So um, for us, uh, if, there, if it's a pre-recorded thing, we just host it on a service. So we use Vimeo, but I mean, there's many other services. You can even host it yourself kind of thing. 
and then you can take those videos and we like embed them in our LMS. We use Blackboard, so that's like if students, if there are students who are from all around the world, kind of thing, they can you know log into the Blackboard and be able to view the video on demand whenever they want. And then Blackboard and a lot of LMSs are very mobile friendly. Our service that hosts the videos is very mobile friendly, so they really have no there's no break there. They can use it you know from a desktop or from anywhere where they're at. Um, for live events, because we're running, I mean, a lot of these events you guys are doing are one way kind of things. It's you want to show everybody what's happening at your event kind of thing. For me, I focus more where, like inside of a class kind of thing, and we want two-way communication. So we want the students to be able to talk back with us kind of thing and have discussion with the professors and be able to do group work. So for that, we use uh, the web conferencing software we use. We're using WebEx right now. And so we have all this production quality. You know, the professor can be there with a the green screen and everything. And then using WebEx, you know, they can log in from anywhere they're at. As long as they have an internet connection, you know, it's variable. It'll scale it down for them to match whatever their connection speed is. Anyone else want to? Yeah, for, <clears throat> for us, um, the, the athletic equation of what we do uh, is different because it's, it's marketing, it's commercialized. Uh, they're selling tickets, they're selling season tickets. And uh, New Lion is, is third party we use in that scenario. And they're backhauling our signal and putting it on a developer website that has a different URL than the rest of UTSA for that purpose. As far as CDN, um, as funny as it may sound, our most effective method right now is using YouTube and or, and or Vimeo. And our best marketing tool for getting things distributed across uh, a lot of different channels is uh, social media. Uh, we have Facebook pages for just about everything that we do and are able to push stuff out that way. Um, that's not to say we don't not, we are not, we are definitely interested in a more sophisticated way of handling that. But as far as doing something quick and easy and also being, to, being able to involve faculty in our student base, we want to present best practices and techniques for faculty and students to utilize what they're already using in regards to the content they make for UTSA at that point. One other, one other wrinkle is uh, we've, we've used live stream quite a bit as of late and we find that that's effective for a global audience because if you already have a Facebook account, as you know, you can get right in on the stream. So um, it's, right now it's, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward for us. You, you actually, uh, let me dive in a little bit on that one because that's one you mentioned earlier and I wanted to find out more about it. You, you talked about live stream and how you're using it. Can you give us a little bit more information about how that works and the scenarios where you're using it most often? Yeah. Um, so. Probably like many of you around budget time, you're looking for tools to effectively help you in the coming year. You're looking at the number of projects you might have done in a previous year and, and what the complexity of the projects were. And uh, we've been, our group, because we all have broadcast professional video backgrounds, we've adopted using a TriCaster and multi-camera shoots for most of our events for a long time. And quite honestly, what I found was that that uh, set uh, that package was overkill for a lot of what we needed happening around the university and more importantly how quickly we could make that available asynchronously after the fact. So doing a little bit of research I came across a small brick made by Livestream, it's their broadcaster. I uh, decided to try that um, HDMI into the box, streams Ethernet, uh, wire, I know I sound like a pitch man, but it's, it's a nice little box. Um, we had a early uh, HD camera, Sony V1, that hadn't seen action for a while because it's tape based and we're all you know tapeless now, but it had HDMI out, so I figured, well, I'll marry this camera with this package and deploy it, uh, and it, it it worked great. It, it fantastic looking picture because it's Sony camera with nice glass on it, um, HD quality, hits the broadcaster, hits the Ethernet. People that want to be involved in that stream can easily they can sign up for an account or use Facebook to log in and has all the interactivity that you would want at that point. It's kind of like a video conference, except it's only one-way video, it's not two-way. So moving forward for more involved events, um, what we decided to do was we have a AJA Key Pro Mini that's HDMI, HDMI capable as well. So we can run one of our bigger cameras, uh, one of our JVCs, into the, into the Key Pro capture, archive the event on a digital format, and also push out the stream. 
Um, you can archive events on that particular uh, content provider or on live stream as well, but we like having control of it before it hits somebody else's cloud. So we're, we're capturing things at a high quality locally, pushing out the stream at what I believe is high quality globally, and um, doing it, I think, cost effectively. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, any other questions before I keep asking questions? Yes, sir. Are any of you utilizing any sort of NAM for asset management? Are any of you us utilizing any sort of Media asset management Man. tool, yeah. Man? Yep. for asset management. We're using um, Kaltura's uh, uh, management console and uh, media space, which isn't uh, a dam per se, like you would think of for a video production sense, but uh, manages media for online distribution. And then Sonic Foundry's media site uh, solution, which is, is uh, comparable. And just a quick follow-up question. Do you have anybody on staff that is cataloging the courses that you're archiving? Yeah, so within the academic technologies group, uh, so they have their own account and so they have their own access. It's, the access is delegated and federated out, so they would have their own access to their account and be able to manage and archive the content that's, that's being made available, or that's being recorded and produced for courses. We, we have a similar circumstance, but in our case, we use, we use the Helix Media Library. There are pieces that are done for online and hybrid courses that are loaded into that particular library. And depending on what department it is, has different accesses to it. As far as cataloging, I don't think there, we have a, I would say we have a basic overall approach to it, but it primarily would fall into the hands of the individual departments that are managing that content. Okay. All right, uh, well, Gary, I, I was intrigued by something you said, and, and if, it, if it doesn't take, um, if it doesn't take us too far off course, I'm interested in the, the, the historical implications of you know, how you got into using Polycom and, and does that make sense and is it something that you think others might have not thought of but might make a good solution? Well, it depends if you got people over a large distance. The reason we ended up with Polycom is because it was an initial grant that was written that said we would, as part of the technology of that grant, we would have Polycoms and deploy them out. In this case, it was with our local public schools for a teacher pre-service teacher evaluation. So instead of having people physically going out, the professors, they could actually dial up and actually see the candidate actually teach the class. Hmm. So, and that was all about uh, in improving teacher education. So we had, at this point, 12 endpoints that were purchased for that purpose. And, and Mission Creek sort of came in, so we had other people on the grant that was teaching a course, but had uh, students in Utah and, and Virginia, and we were in Ohio. So they had endpoints at those locations. One had a physical system, another one used a desktop software solution, and then they had a cohort of master students on campus, so they would all dial in in real time. So. In the, over three different time zones, they were having the actual course run. And I thought about it, it would be great if we could actually archive this because we had no way of recording anything. So we purchased the product from Accordon. It was a, a course capturing system, so you have video talking heads and, and content, but and we had a bridge call, so we actually could have the Hollywood Squares effect that we could have everyone on screen or we hmm. could say, focus in on the on the instructor. So that sort of evolved that process. And, and as it grew over time, we've, we've actually had special use cases where we had people and like I say, a few more people out of state. We even had one person that was deployed in the military and he was sitting on a military base in Japan and he would dial in real time. So it was like 4 a.m. the next day for him and, and we had the cohort on campus with the polycom in the classroom. So mm -hmm. there was so that's sort of how that whole thing evolved, and we saw the, the benefits of it to the point that we'd had guest lecturers or had an instructor on sabbatical in, in Canada and actually came, at, came in and, and helped with the co talk with the, his replacement while he was on sabbatical from Canada. Hmm. So, so pretty helpful for those really right. distant scenarios. Right. Okay, very cool. Um, Chris, you mentioned earlier that you were doing international workshops for Biz School, I think. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and I'm interested in learning a little bit more about that, just, just how you're doing it, you, what, you know, just diving a little bit deeper into what that workflow looks like and, and how successful that's been. Okay, so um, I mean really it's, it's like a scaled event. So it's pretty much what we do for the class is just we scaled it up for this bigger event which is gonna have more students, a lot more international students. Mm -hmm. And what we did for that was we brought the professor in. He's the only one who actually is, who was on campus for the event. And he sits in our production studio. We have a studio there and he sits in front of a green screen at a desk, you know. We made out like a whole layout for him. And we record him on the production cameras and everything. That goes into a switcher and we're able to put, you know, his PowerPoints over his shoulder and any kind of thing we want. We can change the angle of the cameras. And then from there, we have the switcher, the output of the switcher goes straight into the computer. Mm. And we're able to feed that into our web conferencing software, um, the WebEx that we use. And so with that, um, anyone can just log in. It's like pretty much, I mean, it would be like, for the end user, it's like logging into Skype. Mm -hmm. And so it's that easy, you know, they don't have, it's, it runs, it's a software as a service kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they go to the website, it downloads it for that session for them. So they can watch the video. So this is all it. on demand, not, none of it's live, is that correct? No, it's all live. It is all live, all right. Yeah, okay. yeah, this is, it all happens live. Um, and because, and so we needed it live because we wanted to have the students be able to discuss back and forth. I see, okay. So uh, by having it live, the professor, you know, he could, he almost felt like he was like in a class at that yeah. point, right? Yeah. So he can give his lecture and then when they get to the point where for either question and answer or group work kind of thing, um, we could have, they could ask the questions right there yeah. live. So um, with WebEx, you can do like call-ins, so people who maybe, if they really were in a place where they couldn't connect to the internet kind of thing, they can view on their phones. Um, if, they're, if they're at a desktop, you know, they can view the video and everything like that. So. Oh, sorry, you said something about a download. I guess that's what led me off on the on-demand part. What uh, was the oh, download? Just that, um, so software as a service, so it's like, it's hosted in the cloud and then you, you, know, you say you want to log in and it opens up a client for you. It's okay. uh, Java run. All right, so it's really the, the client you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. Not, got it, okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then, Andy, uh, one follow-up for you. You mentioned that you were doing concerts with uh, five-channel HD and yeah. high-production quality audio, and that, that sounds kind of interesting to me, too, because one of the things that I'm starting to see with a lot of our customers is they're, we're seeing more coverage of things that are traditionally sort of these premium-type experiences with surround sound, and, you know, yeah. Dolby Digital and things like that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and how you're doing it and sure. fill us in? So we have uh, <clears throat> the, the, this venue, it's about 1,300 seats. It's our premier performing arts and, um, and lecture hall. And the um, system that was installed was just updated recently. Um, it was first installed in 2006 and then did an update last summer. And on the audio side, we've got this custom rig of microphones that flies in and out of space so we can position it perfectly for uh, orchestral recordings. Mm -hmm. And it's got some DPA microphones and Shep microphones and, and allows us to do a stereo or a surround sound mix. And that's all going through um, an Avid venue console, um, fully digital, and then back um, into our uh, media site uh, uh, infrastructure into a, into a media site recorder. There's also a more standalone sort of model where everything's mixed in DSP and it's just someone unmuting a microphone on a touch panel. And uh, so that, that, that allows for a very simple mode of operation, but then we have this capability to do something more high end. The cameras are Panasonic, three chip, and they've got um, uh, a very nice uh, uh, look to them. They're, they're, they're very compact, but uh, they, they, they produce a nice image. We updated those recently, and so they're all going back over uh, SDI back to um, a Black Magic Matrix switch and a Black Magic production switcher. Um, and then that, the output of that feeds into the media site encoder as well. Got it, okay. And then how are, how are your end users um, consuming the content, especially if it's surround sound? How, how is that going to them and how are they playing it back? So for those media site events, they're not getting the surround sound. They're just, oh, they're okay. just getting a stereo down mix. So you're just capturing it and, and they get the down mix? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Got it, okay. Very good. All right, uh, questions from the audience before I go on. I yes, please. Uh huh. Um, are you finding that, you obviously have found that WebEx is able to take your camera feeds very mm -hmm. well. You, you didn't struggle with getting cameras into WebEx. I ask because Adobe Connect, which is what I'm using, is notoriously bad for taking anything other than a webcam, and you have to fight to get it to recognize any kind of. So I had like a year long. Could you just go ahead and repeat the question? Okay, so she's asking, you know, how was I able to get, you know, production quality video using cameras and everything mm -hmm. into WebEx or anything? She said you were using Adobe Connect. 
she's using Adobe Connect, which is another popular thing for online learning. And it's just those a lot of those programs are designed to be used with just a webcam kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know, it's made for like someone to be at home kind of thing, not in a studio right. or in a very high reduction situation. So I spent like a year doing research and trying out all these boxes and finally Vadio just came out, I think, at their last event. They come out the it's called the A V Bridge and it is the only thing that I've found that you can plug, you know, HDMI, SDI kind of thing, uh, XLRs, and you can plug it in, and it literally goes into the computer with a USB, and there's no drivers install, and it just works kind of thing. Yeah. Wow, nice. Other questions? Yes, sir. I also have a question for Chris. <clears throat> you were saying you shot the speaker with PowerPoint over his shoulder. Were you keying in the PowerPoint? Or yeah. You okay. Exactly. You shot on green screen? Yes. So we had a green screen, and I mean, it's literally, it looked, you know, the, dumb, the, the dumbest down version would be like the weatherman kind of thing, and that's exactly how it was for him. And he sat in our studio, there's a green screen behind him, he's completely lit up and everything like that. So, so the question on that, just for, for the recording, is how, how you, he, Chris had mentioned that the, he had PowerPoint slides over the professor's shoulder and, and how that was being done. Yeah. Sorry, I see a hand in the back. Yeah, um, do any of you use any web Are any of you using webcasting tools that embed slides in the front end layer? Well, I guess uh, the, our Polycom solution does because we have a rich media skin. Uh, the newer ones, uh, they're Silverlight, so you have your video window, then you have your, uh, your content window, which we can pull in PowerPoint, or in the one lecture hall, we have it, uh, we had the system rewired so we can pull in anything that comes in from the desktop, so we can see the desktop of the machine. It's a dual boot Mac and PC, so we can read from either side, and we can also pull in from the smart board. So pretty much anything that displays on the computer, we can actually capture it uh, and the scan, and it's just basically being tied to uh, the, you know, the, the frame count on the, on, the, on, the, on the video, so they're synced. And, uh, and also post-production, if you want to go back and trim things or you want to add PDFs or something else after the fact, we can do that on the editing side of the software, but we can capture everything live. If it's if it can display on that uh, in-room computer, then it's going to be captured in real time with the, in the presentation. Okay, cool. Did that answer your question? Great. Are there other questions? Okay, then we'll move on. All right, so what I'd like to find out is you've all mentioned a number of scenarios, and some of them sound like they're experimental, some of them sound like they're really set in stone and working very well. Can you talk a little bit about one or two of them uh, that you think have been the most successful and ones that you would recommend that other people try for that kind of scenario? Let's start, uh, Ernest, you, you haven't spoken in a little bit. Let's start with you. Well, for this question, I um, thought about it quite a bit, and I'm going to go back to our recent deployment of using um, the live stream broadcaster clients. I just found that it's, um, it's, it's, it's flexible. We, if we wanted to, we could use uh, downstream from our TriCaster unit, three camera shoot, um, if you wanted to deploy it that way, as well as just being someplace quickly and being able to set up a, a webcast. The, the, what I enjoyed about it was accessing, interact, interactivity with it uh, accessing analytics that it supplies you, the fact that you can push it out to social media, not as a live event on, on Facebook, but certainly as a post. Uh, push that out as a tweet on Twitter or on Facebook. And when we do work with part-time help, and if we do have turnover, the other thing I, I do like about this technique, it's quick, it's easy, it's pretty intuitive. It has features to it that we haven't explored yet in regards to we're, we're doing our webcast via Ethernet, but it can go over wireless and it can also access a different type of network too to, 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 to make it more flexible. So I'm kind of excited about pushing, going in that direction in the future. What I'm trying to figure out right now is how to get my iPad to stream over to the broadcaster so it can just have a live stream happen immediately. But from what I understand, there's a product out there that'll take care of that for me right maybe, now anyway. Maybe so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, how about you? Um, so it's lessons we've learned, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, what, yeah, lessons learned, successes from what you've done, what, um, what's, what's worked best, what, what would you not recommend, what would you recommend people don't go that path, you know? <laughs> uh, 
a lot of support for the faculty. So I'm sure you've been through this and you look at your kid with a great kit. It's just, you know, trying to get faculty which might not be so friendly to using technology and they get very intimidated very fast by trying to do this themselves. So just to let them know that they have like the support there to help them do this stuff. I mean, you know, a lot of this stuff is specialty equipment. It's not supposed to be something that they can just pick up and learn. It's something that took us a lot of time to learn how to do and we're trying to make it as easy as we can for the faculty. And so if you want the faculty to embrace it, they need that support just to run the events and be able to do you know, the classes and stuff like that. Chris, can I, can I jump in on that too? Because yeah. that's important to us as well. And I understand completely what you're saying. I, I think that what we're trying to do to establish as a best practice is, I have a video production background and I, I explain to people, I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educator. So any of us that have been involved in video or streaming for a number of years, we have our own vernacular. We have things that get us excited. We probably went out and celebrated, had drinks once we started using H.264. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. But to be involved in the faculty world, to be involved in the educator's world, to get to know what their jargon vernacular is and what they're actually trying to do on as the end product. So what I decided to do was to change the message. Um, when I talk to our faculty, I don't even use the word streaming. You know, we might say something like off-site student engagement. That makes more sense to them because that's exactly what they're trying to do. And from what I've been able to tell with, uh, with talking to some professors who have tried to use video before in the past, particularly streaming, and have had problems with this new generation of appliances and techniques and the way we can stream and push video all over the world, for some reason they're not believing it. So I stopped even using the word video with some of them. We just call it digital filmmaking now, or we talk about narrative, or we talk about things that gets them more involved into what they're really actually trying to do. And we try to come up with as simple, seamless, intuitive products or techniques as we can. So we feel like once we get a professor, a faculty member, a teacher hooked on doing it one time and they did not have a problem or a stumble or a hiccup, they'll do it more and hopefully they'll tell their friends. Yeah. Nice. All right. Andy. So the thing that uh, w when we were deploying our video platform that, that I think was the biggest, biggest stumbling block was policy because it brought up a whole bunch of ideas and concepts and concerns that we either hadn't really thought about before or hadn't really dealt with at, at an institutional level. Uh, so uh, one of the things I would recommend is to start thinking about what is your default policy for streaming media, what do you do in terms of downloads versus streaming, um, in terms of you know FERPA content and HIPAA content and what do you can do about copyright and takedown notices and, and, and get your policy in place uh, sooner uh, than, than your technical deployment is happening. So, and make sure then that your technical deployment um, supports that policy and that uh, those questions are coming up as you're trying to decide whether I should be turning this feature on or off but, but has already happened uh, previously and you've had all the right players involved. And, and sort of a corollary to that is uh, uh, keep your policy, policy conservative um, uh, because it's always easier to, to open things up again but it's not always so easy to rein things in once you've, once you've gotten down that path. Yeah. All right, makes sense. Gary? Well, I agree with it's ease of use. And, you know, those first year, well, first couple of years, you know, we, some people were the unlucky test subjects of what we were trying to do. <laughs> but we learned some lessons learned and then agree you definitely have to have it work right or it leaves a bad taste. And we've learned some things as far as that's why the one room operates the way it is. Basically, all they have to do is show up you know, stick their thumb drive into the computer, you know, no load, no software, you can be Mac or PC, and it just works. Because basically, we were, we were experimenting in evening classes, so you had a lot less load, and but no support, because everybody went home at five. So, we sort of developed a workflow in which basically, short of losing internet connectivity or power going out in the building, they didn't have to touch anything, they just did what they did in, in, the, in the class. And basically once that first couple of weeks of no issues, I don't have to touch anything, I don't have to turn anything off, mm -hmm. you know. Basically we got more buy-in and cooperation from that point once they saw that, yes, we fixed those issues where you had to go in and load this software and log into this process. And, you know, 
from a tech person, it didn't seem like that was much of an issue, but you know, they came there to teach, not to play with the technology. So once we got that workflow and say, yes, it does work, and here's the link to your course, you know, then they were actually looking forward to it because then, and as a courtesy, we would give them a DVD at the end of the semester of all their courses. So mm -hmm. we, and we have an archive of seven years of things that no one is looking at, but they're there for research or evaluation. But an interesting side note, uh, since we would do a, we would hold them online for a semester, and being in Northwest Ohio, we have things called snow days, which I'm sure you know, people around here are somewhat familiar with. But we had an interesting instance where we had a, like the first time in history that I remember the university ever closing, and we were able to put up you know, that week's uh, where they were in the syllabus of the recording from the previous semester so they didn't have to miss a step. So they could actually see the lecture part and it was more of a Q&A and more interactive of the, when they were able to get back in session versus you know, losing a, a week mm -hmm. having to go over that lecture part. They could watch it online. Then they could pick up on the discussion and what they were needed to do assignment-wise versus the lecture. So that was nice. the first foray into the flipped classroom, which we were trying to encourage more of the faculty to do. So, cool. But yeah. out of necessity, that can you pull that, that course back up for us for that right. week? Right. So. <laughs> nice. OK, thanks. We have uh, just a few minutes left. So if there are uh, any more audience questions, let's get those in now before we have to adjourn. So any questions, sir, in the back? You spoke um, a lot about the, uh, how the system works. Is there any, any um, feedback that you have on the user experience and possibly what your philosophy and students are actually playing about the programs that they're creating? So the question is, we talked a lot about the systems we're using. Do you have any experience on the user experience, or feedback on the user experience? Is that, is that basically it? Yeah, what are the faculty and the students saying about the okay. programs that they're creating All right. and the overall experience? What is the feedback from the faculty and the students? So uh, for our program, we constantly do quality circles with the students, you know, beginning, middle, end of almost every one of their classes. Um, you know, the faculty are there on campus, so they're always giving us feedback. And I mean, a lot the students, they just love it, um, especially for our program. So we're doing like graduate MBA courses. A lot of these people are already working professionals. They can't come to a campus. They can't take a semester off from work kind of thing. And so with courses like this, they can work around their schedule kind of thing. So we do almost all synchronous classes. So um, for people who are not, like for more of you guys who are the AV people, it's, you know, there's asynchronous, which is everything is online, you know, it's mostly on demand kind of material. So you go on, you can watch the lecture videos, everything is on a chat or discussion board. And then the other side of that is a synchronous class where, you know, you might have some material that's pre-recorded on demand, message boards and stuff like that, but then you have one period, you know, we do uh, once a week, and for two hours, there's actually a live class, and you know, the teacher can be there and discussing. And we find that if you mix those two, so we have the stuff that's pre-recorded, the lectures and everything, and then you were saying the flipped classroom, which is very much the model we're trying to use, is when they're there in that synchronous session, you know, where they're live talking with the professor, they don't have to sit through all of that lecture portion. You know, why should they? Uh, the professor, you know, it, if they're in that, if if the professors are live and they're there live, why aren't you guys just discussing, doing mm -hmm. projects, working in groups kind of thing? And so if they can watch that pre-recorded material, it's just like reading their textbooks and going over papers and then when they do the live portion, that's the part they really like, is that they can go into class, they already know that pre-material, and they can just go forward. They can talk about what they've learned, they can ask questions and stuff like that, and that's what we found is very much what they wanted. Cool, uh, anyone else have uh, user feedback of any type? Um, I know that our, our medical college students really like the um, 1.5 or 2x playback feature. That seems to be very popular. <laughs> and uh, we, we heard a lot of good feedback as well about the um, uploading of content into Blackboard into our learning management system because before we had a, um, a building block or a plug-in directly into that LMS, it was a very hands-on process of having to go and encode a file and you know, the encoding software might crash, and but it might not, and then you have to upload the file and create a link and all this craziness. Uh, and the idea that, that they could just, you know, select a file, hit upload, and, and it's just taken care of was, you know, real, really transformational and allowed um, uh, the use of media 
in the, in the learning uh, use cases to take off. Very cool. All right, great. All right, well, we have reached the end of our time. If you have further questions, I'm sure the panelists would not mind sticking around for a couple minutes to answer them. But uh, thank you for attending. Thank you to our panelists for coming and, and thinking about these and sharing your thoughts and experiences with us. Thank you.